But if you visit Portland, Oregon, there's a garden there that makes visitors feel like China is right next door. Portland is home to the classical Chinese garden, which means that nothing is random in this garden. Every rock, plant, and building has purpose and meaning. From the moment you enter the Portland Classical Chinese Garden, you're swept away to another time and place. Built to resemble the urban gardens of ancient China, the garden is a place of contemplation and relaxation in the heart of Portland, Oregon. People are just sort of in awe of this. A lot of times when they come through the door, this isn't what I expected. I can't believe this place. It's incredible. This incredible space features the five essential elements of a Chinese garden. Water, stone, architecture, literature, and plants. They all work in harmony to create an ambience that is full of beauty and symbolism. Here, meaning is found in more than 500 tons of rocks that were imported from China lake water that is purposely kept in emerald green to create a better reflection, and the pink lotuses, which represent happiness. This public garden is only the size of a city block, yet it's as big as the imagination. Curving paths, zigzag bridges, endless doors and windows give the illusion that the garden goes on forever. Even the surrounding modern buildings mirror the sky, expanding the garden's view. You see thousand-year-old architecture here. In the foreground then, outside the walls, you see Portland's oldest architecture from Chinatown in the 1800s. And then beyond that, Portland's modern skyline. The Portland Classical Chinese Garden opened in the year 2000. Yet it looks the way a Chinese garden might have looked 500 years ago during the Ming Dynasty. It was built as part of a sister city project between Portland and Suzhou, China, a city known the world over for its exquisite gardens. For 10 months, nearly 70 craftsmen from China worked on the garden. They brought with them all the hand tools and materials they needed to create the nine pavilions, bridges, and paths. They decorated the pavilions with lines of classical Chinese poetry. Poetry is an integral part of Suzhou-style gardens, which traditionally were places where scholars pursued artistic and philosophical interests. The garden is built really to fill all of the senses. They were built as scholars' gardens, so really as an exercise for the mind. Even the seemingly most mundane parts of the garden are rich with meaning. The stone paths are composed of tiny pebbles arranged in intricate patterns. Every pattern has a name. This one is called plum blossoms on cracked ice. All the pebbles and honeycomb limestone rock were hauled here from China, 500 tons in all. To the Chinese, rocks represent mountains, and they prefer rocks with many holes and wrinkles. They say it lends them character. The garden surrounds a rippling green lake, which is kept murky on purpose. The color of the water is supposed to be sort of a jade green with algae and things like that. So unlike you know, most of our gardens that we want to be crystal clear, they really want that, that sort of deep green color. And it's so much more reflective. Crossing the Green Lake is a zigzag bridge. Its twists and turns allow people to see the garden from a variety of angles. In the middle of the bridge sits the moon locking pavilion, a place where people can lock their sights on the moon as it is reflected in the water. But even when the moon is not in view, visitors can soak in the delicate beauty of water lilies, which the Chinese call sleeping lilies because they lie flat against the water. Lotuses, in contrast, stand tall in the lake. These are the petals, and in the middle of that you have the seed capsule, and the seeds are inside of that sort of cone-shaped part right there. And as the petals fall away and this dries up, those will fall down inside the cone, and the holes that are left behind will dry out and become larger. And eventually, when the whole seed pod falls over, the seeds will come out into the water, sinking to the bottom, and then starting more lotus. 
Initially, horticulturist Jody McDonald planted white lotuses. She knew white symbolizes virtue in China. But not long after opening, there was a, an old Asian monk that came in, and he was staring very intently at the white lotus, and I went over and asked him what he thought, and he said, well, in China, we see pink. And I said, oh, wow, why is that? And he says, because they represent happiness, of course. And then I explained to him why I had put the white lotus in, and he was very polite, and he thought about it for a minute, and then he looked at me and said, you know, I think people would much rather be happy than virtuous. So today, pink lotus grow happily in the garden. At all turns, there's more to this garden than meets the eye. A curved roof is not just an architectural element, it's a way to deflect evil. And windows are called living portraits because scenery is framed like a picture. This small Oregon garden is full of powerful images and deep meaning. It offers Americans a portal to the Far East while visiting the northwest city of Portland. When Great American Gardens continues, a 200-year-old rosebush is just one of the charms at this Washington, D.C. estate, once owned by Martha Washington's family. It's just ahead. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. Tudor Place offers a serene getaway from the tourist bustle of Washington, D.C., yet still offers plenty of the history visitors come to our nation's capital to see. Six generations of Martha Washington's descendants lived at this Georgetown home, surrounded by lovely gardens. Today, Tudor Place remains secluded, and it's well worth taking a drive off the beaten path to take a peek. On a stately street in Georgetown stands an unexpected gateway to the nearly 200-year history of an American family. While George Washington had no descendants, his wife Martha did. Tudor Place was home to one of her granddaughters, and its garden is a witness to the story of six generations. The family that lived here stayed throughout almost 183 years and that continuity of family ownership is something that does set Tudor Place apart. The past of Tudor Place lives on in a boxwood hedge that's been standing for nearly 200 years. A garden that was lost in a war then rediscovered more than 60 years later. And a beloved rose bush from Grandma's garden at Mount Vernon. This five and a half acre estate is not as well known as some of Washington, D.C.'s major attractions, but that's part of its charm, because with fewer visitors, it's easy to find peace and quiet here. Martha Washington's granddaughter, Martha Custis Peter, and her husband Thomas bought the property in 1805. Martha and Thomas Peter purchased the property with an $8,000 legacy from George Washington, who was her step-grandfather. Tudor Place began with eight and a half acres, but it shrank when the family needed money. The family sold the upper three acres of the property uh, Martha Custis Peter sold it in order to create dowries for three of her granddaughters. The new property boundary was defined by this old white oak, a tree the National Park Service calls a witness tree because it has witnessed history. The final chapter of that history ended when Armistead Peter III passed away in 1983. Five years later, Tudor Place opened to the public. Heading up the drive today, a giant fills the view ahead, a circular boxwood hedge that's been growing for nearly two centuries. The elliptical hedge first greeted visitors in horses and carriages in about 1816. They would have driven up or ridden up and come around the boxwood ellipse and tied their horses to a locust tree. Horses often chewed on the boxwood, but it still thrived. And today it stands about eight feet tall. On one side of the boxwood ellipse is the mansion, and on the other side are a series of garden rooms. Among the 
them is the Flower Knot Garden. It's a replica of a geometric design that once stood nearby until it was destroyed during the Civil War. The English style pattern was lost for many years, but in the early 1920s, the family rediscovered it in a book on Virginia's historic gardens. Luckily, a cousin had copied the original Tudor Place flower knot at her home. Today, pink cosmos, red roses, and purple salvia are a few of the wildly vibrant flowers tamed into this geometric pattern. In the center, a sundial marks yet another time in the family history. It comes from the Peter family's ancestral home, the Crossbasket Castle in Scotland. Down the path to the east is the tennis court garden. In the late 1800s, the Peters built a tennis court here and formed a tennis club. During that time that the Tudor Place Lawn Tennis Club existed, President Cleveland, it said, used to drive by with his wife and uh, watch the games. Later, the family transformed the court into a formal garden, but it's still dressed in tennis white, wearing dainty impatience, flowering tobacco, and lacy crepe myrtle. To the far west end of the garden rooms is the Bowling Green, a sunken garden that owes some of its beauty to the U.S. Capitol building. The young boy who overlooks the lily pool is a casting of one of the figures from the east pediment of the Capitol's house wing. But perhaps the most sentimental family heirloom is the ever-blooming China Rose, known as Old Blush. Family history maintains this is the same bush Martha Custis Peter brought home from Grandma Washington's place at Mount Vernon. She just particularly loved the blossom that continues to bloom through much of the year. At Tudor Place, the spirit of an American family lives on. In the blush of an heirloom rose, the pattern of a long lost flower knot, and the gnarled limbs of an old boxwood. In this garden, a family took a walk through the pages of history, and the trees and flowers live on to tell the tale. When we continue, a Wisconsin garden that the community calls its own. Volunteers make this garden bloom, next on Great American Gardens. Take a chance with cup. Welcome back, I'm Tricia Springer. Just outside the busy city of Milwaukee in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin, a group of volunteer gardeners have, you could say, replanted the past. The Neeland Walker property has remained mostly intact during more than a century of change. But the Victorian lavishness of these gardens might have fallen into obscurity and decay if community members had not offered to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Wauwatosa, Wisconsin looks like a town made of gingerbread with decorative icing on old-fashioned buildings. One of the oldest Victorian homes in this delicious postcard is the Neeland Walker House, a landmark spiced up with the sweetness of flowers. Victorians were, were notorious for really sort of overdoing things. And so uh, we like to have our garden have that feel. The Neeland Walker Gardens are cared for exclusively by volunteers who dig into the garden to reveal paths to the past. Plant flowers that bloom all season to celebrate Victorian exuberance. And use modern varieties to make everything new old again. Because the Neeland Walker House sits in the middle of a neighborhood, many people are surprised to find that the one and a half acre grounds are open to the public. Often people will say, is it okay if we walk through? And we say, oh, please do. We, we love to have them come and enjoy the gardens. That's why they're here.
In the 1890s, Norman and Carrie Neeland, a wealthy Milwaukee couple, built this Queen Anne Victorian as a retirement home in what used to be the country. The Neeland family later sold the property to Emery Walker, a successful industrial inventor. In 1987, to help preserve the town's past, the Wauwatosa Historical Society bought the house and began planting gardens in the tradition of the Neelands and the Walkers. This is truly a neighborhood garden, not just because it's in a neighborhood, but because it's enjoyed and cared for by Wauwatosa neighbors. They'll come up and take pride in their little areas too. It's, it's kind of like their own personal garden. The historical society really fosters that type of feeling in the neighborhood. They want people to feel that it's theirs. As a boy, volunteer Barry Fuss once played baseball on the Walker's old tennis court. A bunch of the neighborhood boys, we turned it into our own private baseball field. And it was interesting that Mrs. Walker never really interfered with it up until we hit the ball into the, the paddock area and scared the horses. As an adult, Barry returned to Wauwatosa and discovered he could give something back to this place of childhood memories. It's a real kick to do this. Uh, not many people have that privilege to go back to their roots where they grew up and get involved in the community. This season, his contribution is three colors of coleus planted in a spot he calls Barry's Bed. Barry is just one of about 30 people who help plant and tend the gardens. It was volunteers who discovered the continuation of an old stone path, meandering farther from the house than they'd expected. Most of these stones were completely covered with grass, and so we didn't even know that they were here. And as we came and started trimming back along the way, you'd say, oh, there might be another stone, and you'd come and you could feel it. The path curves alongside flower beds exploding with color. To keep these Victorian gardens overflowing with continuous color, gardeners mainly depend on annuals. Peachy old-fashioned bells of flowering maple are typical of the Victorian era. While the rich magenta and brilliant pink faces of wave petunias are modern varieties that bloom continually with no need to remove deadheads. Whenever there's a new variety, we know it's not historically accurate, but we really feel that it's within the spirit of what the gardens would have been. In keeping with that spirit, the Lysianthus is a new fashion surprise scattered throughout the three main flower beds. It's a flower that existed in the south as a perennial, but um, the varieties that we have here are new in the north and are used as an annual. Here the Lysianthus comes in silky variations of pink and purple. Both the old-fashioned and the new-fangled flowers of these gardens create a serene setting, enjoyed by visitors and volunteers alike. In these Victorian gardens, a feast of temporal colors recalls the eternal flavor of another time. Coming up next, Tricks of perspective make this one block garden in Oregon look bigger than it is. We'll take a closer look at the Portland classical Chinese garden when Great American Gardens returns. Dear Collie. Welcome back to Great American Gardens. Earlier in the show, we stepped back in time and saw what a garden might have looked like in China 500 years ago. While the Portland Classical Chinese Garden is relatively small, it looks deceptively large. One of the tricks the architects used to make the garden look big was to include a number of windows. They're called leak windows, and as the name suggests, they allow the view to leak through. Because space is a premium in cities, the Chinese traditionally place the leak windows throughout the garden to fool the eye. Most windows in Chinese gardens are really only in the interior, and they're to denote very special views, really essentially a vignette on the other side of every window. There are 51 leak windows in the Portland Classical Chinese Garden. 
And each gives viewers a sneak peek at what's beyond without ever giving visitors a clear view of the entire garden. A clever way to make people think the garden is bigger than it really is. Thank you for joining us on our tour of Great American Gardens. And remember, public gardens are your gardens.